So I tried two new things when I was in Florida. I got a sapodilla smoothie, even though I was really hungry and thought maybe I should get something I knew I would enjoy, like mango raspberry. But I thought, well, I need to try something new that's part of this landscape and comes from uh, the local cult culture. And so I took a risk, a very small one, to be sure. And then I bought tamarind seeds and saved a bunch of them so I could bring them back home for the confirmation students. And I essentially told them that trying them was practicing how to love people like Jesus loved people. Because we can't love people removed from their culture, their language, their food, their art, their music, their sorrows, their joys, their stories, their histories. I'm happy to say that I think all but one of them tried the seeds. That you tried them, didn't you, Nina? Even if some of them did screw up their faces in great dislike, quite unworthy of the rather benign taste of the tamarind seeds. Then last Sunday evening, Colleen Bernou, a member of the Fond du Lac tribe, and her daughter and two others from the Together Here Ministries of our Northeast Minnesota Synod team led us in the blanket exercise as we traveled through hundreds of years of Native American history. And half of our kids were there to, as Thule had challenged them when I first brought it up, take a risk, which begs the question, why does listening to someone else tell their story feel risky? I don't think there is a clear or one answer to that. I think it's a very individual thing. I think it's a spiritual growth thing. And it takes a tremendous amount of self-knowledge and self-discipline to know and to live the answer and to be able to take the risk. We have to stop and ask, what is going on inside of me that I can't hear what this person or these people are saying? That's true whether it's our kid, our partner, our parent, our boss, our coworker, a friend, someone of a different race, someone of a different culture, different age group, different faith. We have to ask, what, what is getting triggered? Why am I getting defensive? Why are my hackles getting raised? Why do I have to interrupt, take exception? Why do I want to shut them up? What might I be afraid of? Feeling pain, feeling guilt, feeling helpless, feeling blamed, feeling out of control? Am I afraid of feeling judged, overwhelmed? Am I afraid of being shown to be ignorant, out of touch? Is my identity tied too tightly to how I have constructed things? Why is it so hard for us to suspend fear or judgment and enter into another's story? I think it's hardest when someone else's construction of reality challenges our own or when we are emotionally involved with the person. For instance, in my experience, it takes a lot more discipline to ask the same questions of our own children that we can easily ask someone else's kid. How easy I find it to ask disinterestedly of a niece or nephew or neighborhood or church kid, ah, oh, so what led you to try that? When it's your own kid, without some serious centering and praying, excuse me, you did what? 
And sometimes it even matters which kid of ours it is. I can listen to pair and listen to pair and easily refrain from giving him unwanted advice. Kai, I got foot and mouth disease. I've never preached on this Acts text before. Never, even in teaching the books of, book of Acts, have I been drawn to it. But given the current climate we live in, I heard it as if for the first time, clearly and differently. And it's a great text. Because here, Paul at the Areopagus in Athens, Paul, whom one would not praise for his subtlety, shows us what it means to meet people where they are. He enters into the Athenian world. I see how extremely religious you are. I went through your city. I looked carefully at the objects of your worship. I found this altar, and I got close enough to read the inscription to an unknown god. He quotes their poets, lines they would recognize if not know well. This is someone who has entered into their world, who has sought to meet them where they are. He's invested his time, he's invested himself. And he uses a line of their poetry to explain why. We are all God's offspring. We might say it this way, we're all in this together. How modern Paul sounds as if he is speaking to the world in 2023. And it's only after, it's only after he has entered their world and connected with their lives that he knows how to speak the gospel to them. How to speak a word of hope, of love, of grace. His message here isn't, you are lost and need to be found. You are thinking wrong, let me set you straight. He ventures, this unknown God you worship, this is the God who made the world and everything in it. This God made all nations, all nations, not my nation, and you can become part of it, but all nations. In this one, we live and move and have our being. We are all God's offspring. And if all God's offspring, no one, nothing that has been created can be elevated above anyone or anything else. Jesus says to his disciples before he dies in this farewell discourse that we heard last week and it continues today, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Jesus' commandment is, anyone? Love one another as I have loved you. And anyone remember how he shows us how to do that? Some of you came to that Monday, Thursday service. Washing feet. Washing feet. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he bends and washes their feet. Back to Thule's comment. Take a risk. Be vulnerable. We cannot love people if we have not bothered to hear their stories, know their culture, learn something of their language, whether of a people or of the neighbor we sit next to in worship or the little ones who gather for the young disciples message or the teenagers who come to confirmation or middle school youth gathering or our parent or our children whether little or grown. For instance, God may be the one in whom we live and move and have our being, but if I say to you northern Minnesotan Scandinavians, come on, people, let's move. Come on. It ain't going to happen. 
If I go into a black church on Sunday morning and preach for 15 minutes, people are going to wonder what they got out of bed for. 25 minutes at the very least. I preach 25 minutes here every Sunday. You get up on Sunday morning and go, oh man, I don't think we have time to go to worship today. Or given that it's Mother's Day, what we always knew is it's, if it's Pentecost, this was kind of the joke, if it's Pentecost and Mother's Day on the same Sunday in the black church, you forget about the spirit and you preach on Mother's Day. You know your culture. You know the people. You know their stories. The gospel doesn't change. But how we meet people where they are in order for it to be heard does. My sense is this story of Paul in Acts, a little more gracious depiction of Paul than we hear of him in his own letters. But it's such such a beautiful example of how to approach the world, how to approach a new place, how to approach a new people or person, someone we don't know. Enter into their world. Learn from them before assuming we have something to teach. We haven't had a chance to unpack what we felt or thought at the end of the blanket exercise. It was a lot to absorb, but Colleen ended the evening inviting our kids to remember what they learned when they are around their indigenous classmates. Never, never in pity, she said, but with an awareness of the historical trauma they and their families carry, with an awareness of how that history most likely continues to impact their lives. To me, I heard her invite the kids to love as Jesus loves, to meet people where they are, to hear where they are coming from. Kudos to you, church. For two Sundays ago, I was at the Synod Assembly, but you invited Kathy Hermes from LSS Center for Changing Lives to come and teach about pronouns. Good for the 50 of you who showed up seeking understanding, desiring to meet people where they are so you would know how to respect and love them. After all, is that not what God did for us? Enter into our world in the flesh of Jesus so that we would know ourselves as beloved And isn't that what Jesus is doing with the disciples in today's lesson? Entering into how he knows they are going to feel once he is gone, bereft, orphaned, alone. And so he promises to them and to us, I will not, I will not leave you orphaned. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever the spirit of truth. You know her because she abides with you and she will be in you. I in my Father and you in me and I in you. Never alone and always with the power of Jesus, this other advocate, the spirit, freeing us to risk entering into another's world and love them. Love them as Jesus has loved each and all of us. For we are all God's offspring. In Jesus' name, amen.